Welcome to the wonderful world of the Lambretta. In this video, we will go through all the steps of learning to pull, disassemble, look for wear and tear, and finally, readying oneself to rebuild our stock Lambretta engine. Since pulling a Lambretta engine apart for the first time can be a rather daunting task, I've broken this video up into chapters. This way, you can handle each section on your own time. Along the way, feel free to pause the video and look up things you might not understand, or if you're already knowledgeable and comfortable, feel free to forward the video as needed. Before we can get started on a project like this, it is very important to have the right tools to do the job the right way. Not having the right tools can mean the difference between wearing and breaking parts and getting the job done correctly. So above and beyond having a decent set of metric tools, you're also going to need more specialized tools such as an impact wrench, an impact screwdriver, as well as a torch or heat gun. In addition, you're also going to need several Lambretta specific tools that were created back in the day. Today you should be able to get these via various scooter shops, or if you have to, try ePay as a last resort. If you don't already own these tools, it's time to buy them. You won't be able to complete the work on your engine without them. As with any work of this nature, you're going to need to prep a space for our work. Ideally, the space should be fairly clean, well ventilated, and well lit. This way, if you drop or lose any parts or pieces, you'll have an easier time finding them. Furthermore, a well ventilated space should also keep you from huffing in any chemicals along the way. Lastly, you should also don eye protection and a good pair of gloves. No one wants you to damage your eyes or your hands along the way. Unless you've had a recent restoration done to your Lambretta, it's probably been anywhere from 20 to 40 years since it's been pulled apart. In those many years, many of the parts have worn out and seized up. So when running into stuck parts that won't move, try using the following guidelines. First up, we'll start by removing both the left and right side panels from your Lambretta. Place these out of the way. Next step, we'll see about removing the bridge piece found at the base of the floorboards in the frame. You'll need to use a screwdriver and a 7mm long socket wrench here. Set up the socket wrench first and then use your other hand to use the bladed screwdriver to keep the screw in place as you loosen the nut from below. Next step, we're going to want to remove both of the floorboards. With a long socket wrench, reach under the floorboards as seen here and unscrew the two nuts that hold the floorboard to the frame. Once removed, lift the ends of the floorboard rails so you can easily slide the floorboards free of the frame. Repeat as needed, do exactly the same with the second floorboard. Next step, find the wiring from the top of the flywheel. Start by taking some tape, as you see here, and mark each wire. With a pen, number each one a different digit. Now take your cell phone or digital camera and take a photo or two. You're going to use this later on when you're trying to reconnect the stator to the wiring loom. Afterwards, disconnect each as seen here. Next step, look left and find the carburetor. Once you find it, we're going to disconnect the throttle, fuel line, and choke from it. Start by removing the air hose from the carburetor mouth. It also attaches to the air box. Once that's removed, you'll expose the throttle cable end. Using your fingers, compress the throttle spring. This will let you pull the nipple end of the throttle cable free and you can pull it free of the carburetor. In the next step, we'll use a screwdriver and we'll loosen the clamp around the fuel line. Once loosened, you should be able to pull it free of the banjo. Lastly, we'll disconnect the choke cable. For this, you'll need to use a 10 millimeter open wrench and you're going to loosen the nut that holds the whole shaft into the carburetor. Once loosened, the whole assembly will pull free. Now, it's time to undo all the cables to the engine. We'll do this by finding where the cables meet up with the engine on top of the cases. We'll start with the gear shift cables by using an Allen wrench and an 8mm open wrench to loosen each of the pinch bolts. Once loosened, you should be able to pull the cables free. Follow this up by doing the same with the clutch cable. Lastly, find the rear brake cable and follow it to the rear of the engine where it connects up. Here, we'll use two 10mm open wrenches to disconnect the cable from the rear brake adjuster. Once disconnected, you should be able to pull the rear brake cable free of the engine. Following that, we'll remove the exhaust box from the engine. For this, we'll start by using a 14mm socket wrench and we'll remove the two nets that secure it to the front of the cases. Following that, we'll use a smaller 10mm socket and we'll remove a th third bolt that secures the end of the pipe to the tail of the cases. Next step, we'll disconnect the exhaust box from the U-bed. We'll do this by reaching underneath the scooter and loosening the bolts and nuts that clamp the exhaust box to the U-bed. Once you've loosened these, 
you should be able to use your hands and wiggle and pull the pipe away from the engine cases. Now, with the pipe out of the way, we'll drain the engine of any engine oil. Start by sliding a small bowl as seen here under the rear of the engine. We'll use this to catch the gear oil we're about to release. Next step, find the chrome oil plug near the back of the engine and use a 10 millimeter Allen wrench to unscrew this. Be ready to move the bowl as needed in order to catch the gear oil you're about to let drain. Replace the plug when completed. Next step, we're going to use a 24 millimeter open wrench and we're going to remove the two bolts that hold the rear shock in place. Once removed, we can lift the rear of the scooter slightly and we'll be able to remove the shock and allow the engine to tip downward. The downward tipped engine will help us with removing the U-band and cylinder shroud. In this next step, we'll start by removing the bolts that hold the cylinder shroud to the cylinder. Start with a 14mm socket wrench, unscrew the bolt attaching the shroud to the head. Next, find the two smaller bolts that hold the shroud near the carburetor end and unscrew these. While this won't remove the cylinder shroud, it will leave it loose enough around the head that you'll be able to access the two bolts that you need to remove in order to remove the U-bend. So, removing the U-bend isn't exactly an easy task. Why? Because of how the U-bend is situated, it blocks one of the two bolts that hold it to the cylinder. Instead, you're going to have to use a 10mm open wrench on that hard to get to nut. To start off with, we're going to loosen the other 10mm nut with the ratcheting wrench but don't remove it. Then you're going to have to maneuver the cylinder shroud out of the way and you're going to use an open 10 millimeter wrench to slowly loosen and remove the hard to get to nut. By slowly I mean expect to do this in 1 16th turns of the wrench. Then you're going to have to pull the wrench free. You're going to have to twist and turn the wrench. You're going to twist and turn said wrench till you can fit it back on and you're going to do another 16th turn. You're going to do this over and over again. Each time, you're also hoping not to come away with bruised fingers or knuckles. Repeat this many, many times. And once removed, go back to the easier nut and remove it with a ratcheting wrench. The U-band should then easily be removed as well as the gasket found underneath. Now we're ready to drop the engine out of the frame. Before getting started, place a few rags or a towel underneath the cylinder and the engine. This will help us cushion the engine when it's free. Next up, use a pair of 24 millimeter wrenches and use them to unscrew one of the two nuts that holds the engine in place. Next step, take a large set of pliers and you should be able to extract the bolt from the remaining nut side. Be careful not to let the engine just drop here. Ideally, have a friend available to hold the engine in place will make this a lot easier. Otherwise, you'll have to try and hold the engine in place with your free hand. If pulling doesn't work, then use a large screwdriver or a punch and tap the bolt out. Be ready to lower it yourself. You should then be able to slowly lower the engine to the floor and then to the bench for further disassembly. Now that we have the engine out of the scooter, it's time to get started tearing it up. So to start off with, let's make sure we have all the special tools we're going to need for this little adventure. First off, we're going to need to access the flywheel. So we're going to get started by removing the five bolts with a ratcheting socket wrench that attaches the flywheel cover to the mag housing. Start with the one at 12 o'clock and work your way clockwise. As we work and pull parts from the engine, these parts should be set aside in a small bucket or box so that they're not lost. So to start with, take all the small bolts and drop them into a small cup or bowl so that we can keep them organized. Once the flywheel cover is removed, you'll need to remove the dust cover from the center of the flywheel. You can do this by removing the wire retaining ring around the dust cover by using either a pair of needle nose pliers or a bladed screwdriver. Once the wire retaining ring is removed, you should be able to remove the dust cover by simply turning it and pulling it away. With the dust cover off, you can now access or remove the nut that is keeping the flywheel connected to the crank. This nut happens to be impacted on and as such can be hard to remove. I'm going to show you a couple of different ways of pulling this nut off. The first way we'll get started is by removing the flywheel nut is with a trusty impact wrench and a socket. As you do this, expect the flywheel to move and rotate. That's okay. Most of the time, the nut is easily going to come loose with the impact wrench. If not, try this next method. In this next method, we're going to use a Lambretta flywheel tool. Insert it as you see here into the flywheel. This will help keep the flywheel from moving as we use a socket wrench to unscrew the flywheel nut. Once removed, also remove the washer you find underneath it. Now with the nut off, we're going to remove the flywheel. We're going to do this by using a Lambretta flywheel puller tool to remove the flywheel. We'll then take the puller and we'll hand thread the tool deep into place as you see here. 
In the next step, we'll grab an open wrench or an adjustable wrench. We'll use it to hold the main part of the tool in place as we use a socket wrench to screw the bolt in place so we can use a socket wrench to screw in the bolt that is now rested against the crank. This will slowly and evenly pull your flywheel away from your crank. Place the flywheel aside. Now that the stator is visible, we want to prep it before we can pull the bolts that are holding it in place. The simple reason for this is we want to mark the stator at this point because we want to be able to return the timing to the exact spot it was in when we reassemble this. So what we're going to do here is we're going to make a semi-permanent mark to show exactly where the stator was before we removed it. We'll do this by using either a marker or a screwdriver. We'll do this by taking a permanent marker as you see here and we're going to score both the stator and the case to show their placement. This way when you reassemble you can place the stator back into the exact setting it was when we pulled them and keep your timing unchanged. With the completion of marking the stator, we can now remove the bolts that keep the stator in place. We can get started by using a socket wrench on each of the bolts until they come out. Once these are removed, you'll want to draw the stator's wiring through the case and deposit the stator directly into the flywheel. This way, the flywheel can continue to stay fully magnetized during its time out of the engine. Moving forward, we're going to get started with unscrewing the three bolts that hold the magneto housing flange to the case. These will simply screw out, but now that you have them out, the next part is kind of tricky. We're going to need to use some special tools here. First step, find the other two holes in the bottom of the housing that you didn't just pull bolts out of. Take your two mag housing tools and screw each in until you feel them make contact with the cases on the other side. Then start to turn one of them. Now turn one of them one full revolution. Then turn the other one a full revolution. Go back and forth between the two of them. Turn the other one a full revolution. Then you should start to see the mag house flange begin to evenly pull away from the cases at this time. Continue until the mag flange is extracted. Now that the mag flange is removed, we'll work on removing the seals and bearings in the mag flange itself. First up, grab some hefty circlip pliers and remove the circlip that keeps the seal and bearing in place. Once removed, you should be able to remove the seal. If not, you can use a bladed screwdriver and you can carefully pry it out. After that, we'll remove the spacer found between the seal and the bearings. After that, we're going to heat up the mag flange with either a heat gun or a torch. Continue as you see here until the bearing comes loose. So if that didn't work, we're going to actually going to have to really heat up the mag flange. Um, in so doing, we're going to end up toasting the seal as well as the bearing. What you need here is an electric stove or an electric hot plate. A gas range will not do, I hate to say, since it just it won't heat it up enough. Start by turning the electric range up to max or high. Simply place the magneto flange as you see here so that once the flange is heated up and expanded a bit, the bearing will fall from gravity. Keep in mind that this method can take anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes and expect some smoking from the grease and oil um, as well as that seal. Afterwards, clean up any of the spent grease, oil, as well as melted seal. Lastly, we want to organize and inspect our parts. First step, now that we have the small cup or bowl filled with bolts, screws, nuts, and other small parts, transfer them into a plastic Ziploc baggie. The baggie should be marked with a permanent pen to identify what is basically in the bag. Next step, we'll want to inspect the flywheel. Pick it up and look all around for wear, wear spots, cracks, or other forms of damage. Also, check and see that all the magnets have about the same amount of pull to them. If not, it might be time to replace said magnets, or it'll be time to send your flywheel out for new magnetization. Now take a look at your stator. Damage and wear can be easy to spot as it's generally in the form of frayed wiring. If you're running a point stator, take a moment and clean the contacts with either a fine sandpaper or a small file. Lastly, take a look at your mag flange. Like your flywheel, look for cracks and damage to it. Check the threading on the area where the bolts are used to hold, hold or attach the mag flange. If the threads look bodged up, mark them so that you can go back and do the repair work needed. Now that we've completed the flywheel, it's time to work on the top end. So before we get started, these are the tools we're going to need for this work. First off, if you haven't already, it's time to remove the cylinder shroud from the cylinder. Great. Here's what we're going to do to remove the four bolts that hold the head to the cylinder. We're going to remove them in a very specific way. Start by taking a socket wrench and start first on the large nut in the lower left corner. Give it a simple quarter turn. 
Then go diagonally across to the upper right nut and give it a quarter turn. Now drop to the nut below it and give it a quarter turn. Lastly, go diagonally and give that nut a quarter turn. Repeat this pattern until you feel the pressure released on the head. You can then follow this up by removing the nuts and the wavy washers found under them. Once these are removed, the head should pull straight off the cylinder as seen here. Place parts aside. Now with a socket wrench, we're going to remove the two nuts that hold the carburetor mount to the top end. If you haven't already, take a moment and remove the head gasket. Next up, we'll start by turning your crank arm. Or you can just push the piston to the bottom dead center so that the piston is at the very bottom of the cylinder. Now with your hands, take a strong and careful hold of your cylinder as you see here and slowly pull it directly away from the engine along the four shafts that hold it to the engine. Go slowly as the base gasket might be sticky. Do not force the cylinder off, but nonetheless be firm when pulling the cylinder free. Lastly, remove the base gasket if needed. Next up, in order to pull the piston, we're going to need to remove the grudgeon pin that holds it to the crank. Now take a look at the side of the piston. Look for the circlip that's keeping the wrist pin in on each side. We'll want to remove these from both sides. Using a circlip pliers, compress each of them and remove the circlips as seen here. Repeat on the other side. Next up, we'll want to slide our grudging pin out to release the piston. Start by connecting up a wrist pin extractor tool as you see here. We'll follow that up with some heat on the piston from the heating gun. After a minute or two of heat, start to compress the wrist pin extractor tool as you see here. It should pull out of the piston and into the tool. As you get close to pulling it from the piston, be ready to catch the piston as it releases the wrist pin and crank. Place these all aside. Take all the nuts, washers, and whatnot and place them in a single baggie. Make sure to tag it as head components. Now, take a close inspection of the head, the piston, and the cylinder. Next step, take a look at the head. Look for any cracks or damage to both the internal as well as the external aspects of it. Try testing it on a flat piece of glass and try rocking it. If it rocks, your head is most likely a little warped and you should have it reprofiled. Now it's time to inspect your cylinder. First, look for the obvious stuff. This would be looking for physical damage to the internal cylinder walls. Most of the time it's pretty easy to spot and you'll see long gouges to the side walls or you'll find spots where the rings left part of themselves into the side walls. Lastly, we'll use a dial caliber tool to check the bore of the cylinder at both the head and the base levels. We'll record these findings and check them again in the next step. Also. If you're finding anything other than a near perfect cylinder, it's probably time to have it bored out to the next stage. Lastly, we're going to check our piston and rings. Much like the cylinder, most damage to our piston and rings can be easy to spot. If you found damage to your cylinder walls, it's more than likely you're going to see corresponding damage to the piston. Do the same with the rings. If you see or feel any problem with the rings, it's more than likely it's time to replace them. And just like the cylinder, inspect using your glove clad fingers to do much of your work. If you find any problems, it's probably likely you're gonna to need to replace your piston. Finally, use your dial calibration tool and measure the piston at both the top, middle, and bottom skirts. Now take these measurements of both the piston and the cylinder and check them versus other findings in the Stickies manual. This should also tell you if you need a new cylinder bore, new piston rings, or a new cylinder, or a new cylinder bore.